So hello, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Visual Sounds webinar on how to enhance the educational program with VR, virtual and augmented reality. My name is Ramona Vilas. I am the VP of Sales and Engineering for Visual Sound. And I'm excited you are part of today's webinar to be presented by one of our premier partners, ZSpace. You will hear from two presenters today, Joe Pavier, the Senior Director, and Michael Carbinia, Executive Director, who will speak about the ZSpace to enhance education in K-12, secondary space, and CTE programs. How would AR and VR support the blended learning environments in today's current pandemic situations? So before I turn it over to Joe, his presentation uh, from ZSpace, I would like to pass the baton over to Corey Freed, a visual sounds education consultant who will be assisting with monitoring and moderating the chat questions during this presentation. She will provide some few guidelines. Thank you, and I know you will find this information being provided by these fine presenters very informative. Corey, you're on. All right, thank you, Ramon. So as Ramon said, my name is Corey Freed. I'm the educational consultant for Visual Sound. I just wanted to give you some guidelines for today's Google Meet. If you have any questions during the presentation today, feel free to put them in the chat box. I will be monitoring the chat and relaying the questions to both Joe and Michael. We do ask that you mute your microphones unless you have a question that you need to come off for because there is occasionally some feedback from multiple microphones on within the same video conferencing call. We are recording this webinar and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. If I will be putting some links in the chat section for you so that you can get resources to both the sorry for both the youtube playlist and also our schedule of future webinars as we will be hosting more throughout the summer as we move into the upcoming school year so with that i am going to pass the baton to michael and joe and thank you all for attending today thank you corey thank you ramon and um welcome to this webinar today we're excited to be here um as ramon said michael and i both represent zspace and um we are sort of in a unique position in that we get to work in the technology sector, but both of us spent most of our careers in the places where you all are as um, school leaders, district leaders in the South, if you couldn't tell from my, um, my accent here. But I'm located in Nashville, Tennessee, and uh, Michael's in the Orlando, Florida area. And we get to travel the United States working with school district leaders like you all, um, really exploring how is it that this space, the space in which kids are so familiar because that's where they game and do a lot of their activities, um, how can it be leveraged and that same level of excitement and engagement that kids have in the gaming space for purposes of teaching and learning? And as you know, um probably better than we do um we had a lot of success across the united states over the last four to five years as this space evolved but in march we had this sudden screeching halt that really challenged us to move beyond the brick and mortar and explore okay what how can it be leveraged for um use at school in brick and mortar more traditional means but also um, how can we now let kids do things that would otherwise in some cases be impossible to do, experience things because now maybe they're having to work and learn in a remote environment. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna explore what that can look like in both the STEM areas as well as career and technical education. Um, as Corey said, she's going to be monitoring the chat, so I would encourage you as we go through the next um, 45 minutes together to um, use that chat feature, and Michael and I both have stood before many, many faculties, and we're used to having those questions asked and being able to respond to them, so we'd love to, to answer any specific questions that you all have throughout the presentation. Uh, what I'd like to do first, though, is go over what our agenda for today is going to be. Um, we plan to start by really exploring what is AR and VR. We want to make sure that we level set on the webinar with our group understanding of what these spaces are. 
like I said, it's a continuing, continually evolving area. So um, even some of the definitions that we used a few months ago are different today. And I fully anticipate that they'll change and evolve more in the future. Uh, we're going to look at how are they being used in the career and technical education as well as STEM fields. And then we want to give you an overview um, to look specifically at how this type of technology and content can impact the courses of study that are offered in your elementary, middle, secondary, high school, as well as post-secondary um, areas. So one of the things so, we want to go, go ahead, Michael. Oh, I was going to say, um, obviously, the, so again, thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Michael Carbini. I'm the executive director of uh, career and technical education. And just like Joe, uh, my most recent stop before joining ZSpace was down in St. Lucie, Florida, South Florida, of a school district of about 38 to 40,000, where I had 62 career academies. Uh, so that's where we, uh, where I've been in the, in the space before joining. So one of the things, though, with that is always at the end of the day, uh, it comes down to dollars and cents. And we understand that because Joe and I have uh, personally managed all these various budgets. And we like to be upfront with everybody and transparent. And that everything you're going to see today is a uh, this is a set of allowable activities. This is actually published by the Wallace Foundation that some of you may be familiar with. It's an educational um, think tank, but they really do a good job of drilling down on legislation and letting you know what is allowable. So uh, with we the most recently uh, shared out CARES Act, what we like to do is let you know where Z space falls into that. So you know right off the bat with anything you get excited about seeing today that you'll know that it is eligible for all forms of federal spending, whether it's Title I, II, III, IV, or it's gonna be Perkins or CARES Act. You'll see here where the pluses are that we are eligible for those obvious reasons. So uh, the easiest one is going to be, of course, the purchasing of educational technology for students. And uh, that's just something we like to put out out front. If you have deeper questions about how to access or what your, your area is doing, that's a, a separate offline conversation I'm happy to have with you. And Joe and I can help you navigate that area um, if those are areas that you would like assistance. So now that we've got that elephant sort of addressed, because it's always the one in the room as you explore any new technology, um, let's really step back from a specific product, that being ZSpace, that we'll talk about today. And let's do a survey of this technology landscape. When you hear all of these acronyms, VR, AR, you may have even heard XR or MR, um, with the thing that's consistent among all of them is that R realities. Um, the two most prevalent ones that students are engaging with today, and maybe you are as well, and maybe you've seen some of this being used in your district, um, one is virtual reality, VR. Um, most people, when they think about VR, they think about what's called the head-mounted display, or HMD. It's that device that you put on, similar to the way you would put on glasses, but when you put it on, it fully isolates the learner from the surroundings. You've probably seen these when you've gone into Best Buy right at the front of the store. It's been a big promotional tool. Or maybe even when you upgraded your cell phone, they offered to bundle an HMD <clears throat> with your purchase. Um, most commonly in education, it's been used with Google Expedition with the Google Cardboard that you may have heard about. But regardless, the key um, feature or affordance of the HMD and virtual reality is that the student is fully immersed with the content. Meaning that if a student's learning about under the sea and they go into this space, regardless of where they look, whether it's behind them, around them, they're going to be under the water examining sea life. Now, I want you to remember that full immersion aspect of it so that as we talk about these other realities, you have a comparison and contrasting point. Because now as we switch and we leave virtual reality and we talk a little bit about the second space, augmented reality, which should populate, there we go. Um, it's a space that 
probably kids are most often on a day-to-day -day basis, even hour by hour and minute by minute, students are communicating with each other. Um, you may have seen it with Snapchat or even in Instagram where you can take um, a picture or what's really happening in a space and you can put digital content on top of it so that all of a sudden maybe a person is uh, smiling and taking a selfie, but then they add that digital content that all of a sudden turns them into um, a, a puppy dog with ears. You may have also seen it when um, you go on the uh, some of the new websites for stores, like if you're going to go buy some new glasses where you can turn your camera on on your computer, it shows you there, but you can virtually try on the glasses. That's augmented reality or AR. And what uh, is the key feature there is that you have what's really around you and you're augmenting it with some digital content. So um, again, you probably noticed I didn't mention anything about that head mounted display and full immersion because the difference is with virtual reality, you don't have what's really around you. With augmented reality, you do have what's really around you and you're augmenting it with content. Then you have the space between or that takes elements of both virtual reality and augmented reality and really looks at and leverages how can we use it for teaching and learning, gaming, uh, looking at patient data in a hospital environment. It's that space where the student does not have to be fully immersed, but they can experience other places, other content. And it can also be used to augment what's really around you. And that's where ZSpace falls in. You may have also noticed that uh, if you walk through um, a mall and there was maybe a Microsoft store, right now in the front, very front, you're gonna see the Microsoft HoloLens. Um, look close at that next time and you'll notice that you can see the person's eyes when they put their little glasses on. That's what makes it different from the head mounted display because the student through those glasses sees what's really around him or her, but also can interact with digital content. So we have this technology landscape that um, can be represent content in different ways. And what we want to do now is really peel back the layers and look at what is ZSpace specifically. So um, <clears throat> when, we, when we talk about ZSpace, what we're talking about is a device. And the device can either be an all-in-one computer, like you see on the left-hand side, or it can be a laptop. And you will notice the student puts on glasses, but those glasses don't isolate the student from his or her surrounding. You'll also notice that the student here has um, a stylus, looks similar to a pen or a marker, and that stylus is what allows some interaction to occur. So in the case here, we've got a student who's pulled out a car engine and is doing, I think it's a car engine, is doing some assembly and disassembly. And then on the right, we have a student who, um, is dissecting a frog. Uh, regardless, they have access to that content. They're able to interact with it just as if you were working with the real object in a classroom space. Um, some features that allow all of these interactions to occur are built into those screens. So you do have to have a unique piece of a hardware in order to make this occur. And that unique piece of hardware is the ZSpace experience. So what happens is the computers both have built into the edges around the screen um, devices that track the glasses and the stylus, and they allow for the content to come out of the screen just like what you're seeing visually represented in the pictures here. Some other things teachers can do, though, is they can connect these with their interactive flat panels so that if they're wanting to do some whole class instruction or if students complete a dissection and they want to share with their peers or with their teacher to demonstrate a mastery of learning and understanding, um, they can do that in a larger setting. The one thing that's not represented here that's critical, though, is that multiple students 
can sit at the device together and collaboratively work. So if the young man on the left side and I wanted to work on a car engine to talk about what we were doing, just as we would in the workforce, then I could put on a pair of glasses as well and I could observe what's happening. We could dialogue about it and work through it. Now, I point that out because we all know that as we look at those 21st century skills for learning, that collaboration rises to the top and that that's a key affordance that not only helps kids learn in the classroom, but prepares them for the workforce in which they're going to go. I also pointed out as a real um, talking point around the difference in a head mounted display versus a device like ZSpace where you can collaborate. So what does this mean for the problem we're trying to solve? Well, we know that we um, hit a pivotal point in education that for many of us, we're trying to figure out now, um, but most districts are in this pro are working through this problem of what does school look like in the fall? And we know the language that's been around with blended learning previously, you may be hearing the term hybrid learning. Um, what we wanna do is sort of peel back the layers of that and say, okay, on a continuum where on the left you have face-to-face -face instruction, on the right you have pure distance education instruction, um, what are all the components that fall on that continuum? And how does a tool that uses AR, VR, like ZSpace, um, fit into all of those scenarios? So if you're really peeling through and thinking about blended learning in your district, um, feel free to check out our website. Um, on our educator resources page, you'll not only find the blended learning strategies, but you'll find short videos showing kids and teachers using ZSpace to incorporate um, into those strategies. So once you've selected the type of device you're going to use, then obviously you choose the content. And although these icons are fairly small, what I really want to, to point to here is that it's a wide breadth of application. Um, everything from elementary through medical school, it's not just science and math. There's also social studies content where students can go to uh, the Globe Theater, take it apart and learn about it. Um, art, there's an application called Leopoly where kids can sculpt and ultimately if they want to 3D print, they can do that. Um, coding uh, with BlocksCAD. Uh, you may have heard of Tinkercad where the kids are able to do some creation. I like to challenge people to think about ZSpace a lot like you would have thought about a uh, one-to-one -one student, iPad, tablet device uh, eight, nine, 10 years ago. You have the device, but then you select the applications you want to use based on what your implementation is going to look like. And then based on what applications you use, um, that's how you make your decision about which applications that you're going to buy. But again, cutting across all areas, um, cutting across all grade level bands to enhance the, your STEM programs. So with that said, now that Joe's given you an overview, uh, we're gonna kind of move into the CTE side of the house. So what's important to know, and, and this one device that you, you were hearing about today with ZSpace allows you to cover all of that content area on one device. And that's a big differentiator between us and other uh, hardware out there, but you saw Joe talk about the K-12. So if you're in the adult education credit versus non-credit on your post-secondary side, there's a lot of the added value that you get from the applications that Joe just told you about. Uh, as we move into the CTE side, you can know that 12 out of the 16 federal clusters that are listed on the Carl Perkins uh, by the standard are covered by ZSpace. So we're not gonna be able to get into all of those today, again, because it's an overview. But as we go through and you want a deeper dive, please reach out to your visual sounds team and I'm happy to do that with you at another time. Uh, one of the other pieces we're really excited as you're aware of with career and technical education, it's all about students and the ability to earn an industry credential. So we have partnered with Nocti and we are in fact the only AR VR product that is endorsed by Nocti as an organization. 
for and what that really means is that all of our CTE applications lead to an industry credential. So currently that sits at 33 different options that in a blended classroom, and just to be very clear, that's not saying you can do 100% everything virtual because at some point you still have to touch a wrench, you still have to be able to weld, but it's the blended approach that you heard Joe talk about um, working with ZSpace and Nocti, you're able to earn those credentials and there's 33 different ones. Um, also, just for the, the note of the group, we've already addressed how to do this remotely. Uh, Nocti has partnered with ProctorU to allow students to be able to uh, remotely still take their industry certification exams. We just wanted to make you aware of that, that we've already been proactive in the approach, regardless of what your district or area decides when we start school back in August and September. So what it also means is that we align everything to a blueprint. So that is the answering the first question of how will you use ZSpace? And I'm about to show you what that looks like. But when we talk about how, when we see things on a blueprint for your scope and sequence to talk about identifying and applying appropriate medical terminology, that leads to these three applications, and that can all be done inside of ZSpace. Now, that's not to say that there aren't other industry certifications and not to get too acronym crazy, but for all of our health people here, we know that this is a sequence where uh, my students start with their CMA, they would earn their EKG and, and keep moving up the ranks to eventually hopefully being uh, an RN. But we are supplemental to all of those and you're able to use ZSpace to support. We have a number of post-secondary institutions that use us and I'm happy to talk to more specific examples if that's something that interests you later. Um, one of the first ones I want you to see now, as we start to lay the groundwork for you to see what it looks like, this is using ZSpace in a two-dimensional way, looking at three-dimensional objects. So you're going to see here, we have the heart. This is our explicit EKG application. Great advantage is students don't typically have an EKG machine at home. Um, you're seeing here, you're, they're able to grab the heart. They pulled out the uh, have and they're manipulating it. They're looking on the regions on the heart. So they start to learn about how the electrodes tie to the heart and they're getting those readings. You're seeing the three-dimensional interaction in a two-dimensional way. So that answers your first question of how do you do this in a blended learning? You can record yourself or the students could record themselves, which leads to the electrode placement, which is the actual act that they would do to earn this credential. So that's where you're seeing here, they're given the dummy and they're able to place their electrodes on sign here students are able to focus on and change the build of it so they can see did i appropriately place that in the intercostal and then of course we give them what it should be uh, and you can see that student had it in the wrong place so they need to adjust and, and that's what they're able to do but there was no consumables were not chewed up you didn't lose anything and they got meaningful feedback as they were going through the process so that's kind of the first look at it. And this next one is going to be, think about all those models that you would have students typically have access to, or you'd have them huddle around that skeleton and they would talk about learning their standard health and anatomy and A and P. Um, now take all of those, but what usually happens is you end up missing a T, some teeth, a kidney, half of a lung. None of that's able to, you know, you're not going to lose anything in a virtual setting. So what that really looks like, and again, showing you this is, a, for instance, this is used in a dental program, but it could be um, used in, and again, a biomedical or a wide variety of programs in the health. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, again, two-dimensional, I'm going to show you what it, the best we can, what it would be like when you put on those glasses and it comes out. But as they click on the book, it's going to give them their medical terminology, and it's going to be able to talk to that specific piece, you can go to the systems and you can add the systems and see how the nervous system impacts that blood flow for the teeth. You can also go in and take a very physiology approach and really focus in on just teaching this element. And then okay, medical terminology is throughout the entire application. Um, this is one of our most popular applications uh, across all levels. And you're seeing here, you're getting access to things that students would definitely would not have access to in a room, you know, in their home if you're doing this blended. And then in this new world, uh, you're typically losing a lot of time setting up and worrying about that. There's, you know, it allows you to be able to do this in its own self-contained way. So again, that is 
three-dimensionally viewing it in a two-dimensional way. So think if you have a Canvas system or Blackboard or Schoology, um, you're able to record these. And a great example of this is down in Texas, actually. Um, we have a school district who the teachers all have the laptop. They're recording all of their lessons right now like this. That way, when they come back in August, it's already all built on their Canvas system. And then they're going to be able to teach remotely. They've already decided they're going to go to AB days. So that's something that just another example of a really great district doing it. We do have many, many lessons that just so you're aware, this is on zspace.com. So you, it, there's no paywall. There's no you got to sign up. You can just go to zspace.com and you can see all of these lessons. So you know the breadth and depth that it goes into. Um, now, what I want to try to do is really set the stage for you in using this. This is one of our head trainers and head CTE specialists. Her name is Nikki Lester. And we're going to show you what it's like to use something called ZView. Now, this is where it could be done live on Google Hangouts or Zoom or, a or Microsoft Teams, the platforms that do exist now. But what you're going to see here is her rotate between 2D and augmented reality. So if we go back to the beginning, you remember what Joe said, you're going to get a chance to see that. Hello. Today we are going to cover a little bit of Human Body Atlas and some information on carpal tunnel through one of our models just so that you can see what it looks like in a 2D and augmented type of view during a recording if technology is not available for students to actually work with, but maybe for the instructor to have available. So to get here, we're gonna open Human Body Atlas, which I've already done, and I'm going to open up my menu. Under my 3D models, I'm gonna go ahead and select the muscular system view, and I'm gonna go under the wrist and hand. Now, notice this is a 2D view, and the reason that we're going to do that is we're going to flip through a few things that can actually be looked at here. Uh, and one of those would be going ahead and selecting particular areas, because how do we know where carpal tunnel affects the wrist and the hand? So by going ahead and selecting some different areas, I'm just going to kind of explore. And in here, I went ahead and selected the abductor pollicis brevis. So I can get the, uh, the wording or the exact pronunciation to be read to me based on the sound if I have external speakers or headphones on. I then can go ahead and click on the book icon, which will give me the full definition of the abductor, abductor pollicis brevis. Now down here, how do I know it's affected by carpal tunnel? Well, I do have a patho with a little stethoscope that covers some of the common ailments that go along with the abductor pollicis brevis, one of those being carpal tunnel syndrome, and I can actually read through that full definition. I can do that and I can see different areas and see where those areas, if affected or not by carpal tunnel, and there goes carpal tunnel there. There also goes carpal tunnel at some of the band areas, the flexor rectinaculum, which also has carpal tunnel, and the extensor rectinaculum. So all of the above, but for this activity, we're gonna go ahead and select the abductor, abductor pollicis brevis, and we wanna do a deeper dive. So we're gonna go ahead and explore the muscle, and we're gonna open up one of our animated views. Now I'm gonna go ahead and jump into Z view so that you can see in here how the flexation of that hand works. And again, we have still got the capabilities to select um, some of the areas, but if you're looking on screen, you no longer see those. The focus of this and being able to show this model is how to really look at up close and personal and be able to further discuss how the abductor pollicis brevis can be affected by the carpal tunnel in conjunction with some of the other areas like the flexor rectinaculum, et cetera. So then we can go ahead and flip out of Z view and it will take us back into the regular view where we now can see that definition again. So today, just a little bit of information on how to be able to jump between 2D and the augmented view, especially if you have to do a recording or be able to see in a version where you do not have access to the technology right in front of you. Thank you. So as we move through, that's the first look at what ZV would be. Now, remember, if you had had our glasses on, you were sitting in front of us, you would have seen that come off the screen in your own real time in front of you. At, and that's the, the environment you would get because, you know, we are talking about using a mixed reality AR and VR platform. 
But what's important to note is that process you just saw, we can do that through all of our applications. And due to time today, we're going to, you know, I want to leave time for questions. We're going to accelerate through some things. And I want to mention, again, we will have, we're happy to do a deeper dive with you on any of these content areas that you may want, because we have many applications that we're not going to be able to cover today. But the same principle that you just saw Nikki go through is available with all of our CTE applications. So as we move into the automotive technician, again, you're going to see the blueprint. Um, but that's not to say chances are your program are probably working on their ASE certification through NATEF. Um, those organizations have, have blended together now. This is just an example of some task sheets that you would get and the students would get. So having them do that in this new world is going to be really, really challenging. However, doing it through ZSpace is completely possible, and we've got a great system that allows them to gain access to all of these parts of the vehicle that they wouldn't. Um, now, just to be clear, ours is designed for light gas right now. Uh, we do not have body because typically automotive programs are split. We do have, as you can see on here, what the body of it is, but that's really just a definition of the body of a car. It's not actual body shop um, where somebody would be working on the structure of the vehicle that's forthcoming but right now it's about what makes the car move and the gas industry certifications a1 through a6 so you're seeing this application this is called auto expert where the real value here is you can take existing content because i'm sure your instructors have uh, something like cdx or electude or something they've done with pearson or gw these are great great products and they give you powerpoints for 180 days of instruction now imagine taking those and adding models to them instead of having your students stand around them like they used to do where these are static items they're not going to move that could be very dangerous you can now do those in a virtual sense so whether you're teaching the starter or you're going through it you're able to do it and put those powerpoints over top of it but what i want you to see is that what it looks like when the students get their hands on and actually they're able to, this is again the student view and they would have their glasses on, they would actually turn their head and look all around. So in this case, we're gonna explore the transmission and you're gonna see what these students would actually do. On the right hand side is gonna be the tools. So you're seeing the student is being guided through this entire process. They're selecting the socket wrench, they're putting that over the flashing green piece and it's actually going to take it apart. Up in the top center, you're seeing what tool they're supposed to be using and what step they are in. So this is allowing the students to get meaningful, direct uh, training on going through this process. So what we have uh, another post-secondary institution in Seattle that is doing this, where students are taking the laptops home, they're going through their repetitions, and then they're able to split to morning and afternoon and then the students are still coming into the shop. They're a smaller shop, so they don't have the time or the space to get everybody in, but this is allowing them to go through it. We've also have institutions that use this for a wide range of students that have certain IEP needs or 504 and accommodations. This is a great way in a blended way in this new world to still accommodate these students and still to give them access to meaningful, purposeful content that can work towards an industry certification. So again, that was a, three-dimensional view being recorded. So you're seeing here, as I mentioned, there's a three training modes. We have a guide mode, which is what you just witnessed where it's flashing green, it's going through it. Uh, the training mode, it doesn't flash green. The only way they get a hint is when they click at the bottom, excuse me, and get a hint. And then of course we have the exam mode. In the exam mode at the very end, you get a sample printout like this. And again, if you remember the beginning, this is great because when you save it, it saves on your desktop and you're able to take that and you just, it's a PDF and your students submit that to whatever Blackboard, Canvas, Schoology, on and on. That's all they're doing is turning that in. So the instructor is able to have, you know, 30 students taking apart 30 different parts of the car and still get meaningful direction and feedback to them and know what they are accomplished. The other great advantage to ZSpace, as Joe mentioned, because we're application-based, internet is not required. Uh, you do need it, of course, to submit your application, what the work they've done. But the actual processes that you've seen today, those are all run locally on the machine. So no matter how rural the population, no matter what your Wi-Fi situation is, you're still able to continue learning. And that's something we're really excited about. 
And again, just so you're aware, we do have electrical as we start, we are launching an alternative fuel package. I won't have a chance to go in that today, but if you're exploring uh, lithium ion and the Teslas and the Prius and how those alternative fuels look, we do have an application that takes them through the whole training. They get to do a lot of electrical because of course it's far more electrical in these cars um, with the failure simulations, things that would be incredibly dangerous. And the reality is most secondary students are not going to have access to this because of the uh, legality around working with lithium ion. Um, a really great application that we're happy to do a deeper dive for you at another time. Um, so I'll take a quick pause. I know we're going fast, but is there any, I can't see the chat. Otherwise we'll keep moving. So Michael, you actually have two questions in the chat right now. The first question is, what's the most common challenge for implementing AR, VR, and MR in a classroom? Do you think it's funding, space, or something else entirely? Oh, that's, uh, I think what I've seen is in just being really candid in the CTE world, um, the teachers really want to embrace the technology or they're just not comfortable with it. So it's a weird way of trying to get them excited to understand we're not trying to replace you. You know, I think the CTE teachers take automotive. Um, they initially will see that technology as a way to uh, phase them out and really making them feel comfortable. So it's not that it's a hurdle, but it's a conversation that certainly needs to happen at times. That's probably been the most common. It's never the students. It's never the students. They're so comfortable with this. Um, but just as you saw Nikki, um, Nikki is also a former uh, military diesel mechanic. And then our head trainer for health is a former, um, uh, she's still an adjunct professor for uh, Wichita State in the RN program. So we've been really focused on making sure the people that are teaching you how to use this actually are just like you and their peers. So you can, you know, really feel confident going into it. I hope that helps answer that question. All right. So the next question was, how would this look in a virtual school? So you did talk about blended a little bit. That question was posted earlier, but if you can elaborate, please. Yeah. So in a virtual suiting, I think the biggest hurdle that you'd have to talk about is you're going to want to send these laptops to students. However, I know in Florida, uh, our virtual schools still have a school center that they come in to do labs and those variety. So um, we have worked with virtual schools. Uh, I'm not the expert on that one. I, I would best save that for a second conversation. But um, we do have people that send these laptops home because you could dissect a, a cow, a fetal pig, a frog. You know, you can do the human body and take apart a car, robots. You can just send the device and they're able to do it. And we provide CDC cleaning guidelines. We do have a number of programs that are doing that. That's actually better for Joe. And I think we'd be great to set that conversation offline. But uh, that is very popular and growing. All right. And the last question currently in the chat section, what technology is being used to track the stylus and glasses? Is it IR? So it, there, it is infrared. Um, that is the Z space technology. It's a series of six cameras that as, you, as Joe mentioned, the head mounted display, uh, it's reverse engineered inside of the hardware. And actually, if you if you really it's stereoscopic to get really geeky, if you go to zspace.com, you'll see right in the top left hand side, it says technology and it will explain all of our technology because we use a serious passive glasses. Um, it was really designed to allow long use uh, of AR and VR at a time. But yes, um, infrared is one of the other features that is a part of it. But that's actually all available on our website. We don't hide it. Uh, if you go to zspace.com and click technology, you'll see that. Great question. All right, so that was it for the chat section right now. But I have a follow-up question to your answer for that last one. You mentioned that it's designed for that long-term use, but I know there are a lot of VR products that say if you're under 13, don't go mm -hmm. more than a half hour. So. Is yes. Z-Space something that the primary grades can use for a longer period of time, or do you still say, like, try to limit it to a half hour at a time? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And remember the big difference between us and the head-mounted display, because you're absolutely right. Uh, Oculus, HTC Vive, they all literally explicitly tell you not to do longevity, because if you just think about the technology, that's literally a screen dead in front of your face. Um, whereas because Z space uses a, our glasses, there's actually no technology sitting, you know, an inch away from your face. Um, so that's something that was, that's also by our design. Of course, we still recommend that this is not 
you know, you don't do this every day of every minute of, uh, of what's going on in classrooms as well. But this is still a traditional laptop. It is a Z-Space laptop that runs Windows. So you're still going to have them access. The great advantage of us is you just put on those glasses. So, um, yeah, no, that's a great question. And it's a complete, uh, completely accurate. All right, so that's it so far in the chat section. If anyone else has any questions, please feel free to include them and we will make sure that Michael and Joe answer them. Awesome. And this next session is going to go really fast and I know it's popular. So again, uh, I, we love doing these. We're happy to have these con continued conversations with you. Uh, we break our manufacturing bundles uh, into kind of chunks where we know the core fundamentals of mechanical fluid and pneumatics, whether you're a VEX program or your first robotics or you're working on standard uh, pre-engineering or mechatronics, these are core fundamentals. I mean, I, I personally have overseen these programs, so we really, really know this is a, a content area that's very close to me. However, we know that not everybody gets into the full robotics, automation, PLC, uh, logistics, so we separate the two. And what that looks like, again, with the blueprint is depending on if you're doing a more CAD based program, we do a lot of developing, testing, redesigning, prototyping. A great example is down the University of North Texas and their textile program. They do almost all their prototyping in Z space because, again, you're able to take a three dimensional object that you're viewing on a two dimensional plane and actually see it. So when it goes into Z space, you can pick it up and manipulate it and turn it around and rotate your head and see it. And that's a really great case. I'm happy to talk more about that at another time. Um, but as you'll see here with Mechatronics, things like lock in and lock out, tag in, all the standards, um, you can do all of those in Z space. So we give you all the fundamentals. These are gonna be your widgets and connections, supporting parts. No matter what area you go into, these are parts you're going to learn about. So um, again, what that looks like in 30 seconds is taking something very simple like a planar four bar where the principle, you're going to see it move. Students will not typically have access to this. So simple machines, project lead the way. It's a very great, strong complement to all of those programs. You get to see it. But what I, one of my favorites is the diagram because you start to see the math. So they see the importance of the geometry. Here it's talking about dead center and what the value of that when in the engineering process. And that's something that would be impossible for a student to see if they didn't have virtual reality to allow that to do it. Uh, so that's a really popular application for us. Of course, once they understand all the pieces and parts and how those work, we want to give them that hands-on. That's our theme. So they take the hands-on component. Um, we give them a schematic. And after they've learned about the schematic, we give them the opportunity to build a hydraulic system. So it can be hydraulics or fluid. Now, highly unlikely students are going to have access to this at home. And even if they do in their manufacturing programs, you typically have one, maybe two of these setups because they're, they're quite expensive. Um, but doing it in a virtual sense, you can see here, they can build their relief valve. They can go in and go, okay, next, I need a solenoid, two position, two way because that's what it was on my schematic. I'm dragging that down. The green is letting them know it's the appropriate one. Of course, it's going to have to have an actuator that allows them to, uh, to move what, the, what they're actuating and moving. And then the accessory, the T-joint. So once they bring that in, the really cool part is then they get to run the wires. So they're going to run the hose that goes through it. And you're going to see them make those connections. And they're going to be able to build the system. But that allows... Just like I'm doing now, you can voice over it. They can do this remotely. You can do this in real time with your students. And they can talk through why. Do they understand that they crossed hoses? What does that do to the process because they lose pressure? Um, are they aware of the placement? Is that what was exactly how it was placed out on the schematic? And then they're able to actually run it. And it, if it's hooked up correctly, you'll, as you'll see now, it will operate. And they'll see the moving of fluid or pneumatics through in the process. So that's a really popular application for us. And then of course, that all leads itself into the robotics or logistics, uh, PLCs, we have that as well, where um, the robotics that are in the industry, whether it's a FANUC or a Festo or a KUKA, all of those are operated by a combination of pneumatics and um, hydraulics. So this is where we teach them all the components of that. Uh, one of my favorite ones is Kometic accesses because this is typically impossible for somebody to see. Uh, 
because of how the robots are built. So they get to see this, they get to understand what's going on there. And if that's too high level, it's also a really great way to give students just plain exposure to an industry that is incredibly high demand, extremely high wage. It's a great way to expose them to that environment. We give them access to a teach pendant, which is something that's really cool that they wouldn't be able to do. Because uh, typically, if you do have these robots, you have maybe one, two, I've seen three, but these are really expensive, hundreds of thousands of dollars, awesome. And you don't necessarily want students just going in and playing and massing with the job keys, but in here, they're able to do that and they can rotate it and they can play with it and they can, you know, they can't break it. So this is a FANUC, they're able to do that, but it allows them to play with it in a way that they haven't been able to do it and they could do it remotely. Um, they also have the ability to take apart the brain so they can strip down the motherboard, they can replace the fan, they can work through all the components of the, uh, the HMI or the head component, something you would not want them to do. But as they prep for the maintenance portion, they're able to do it all virtually. Um, they could, the other one great advantage is they can actually disassemble these robots. So they can take apart this robotic arm. We're prepping them for that FANUC level one or the NOCTI certification. Um, they get to work on the daily, quarterly, and annual maintenance. And this is all self-guided. It takes the students through it. So the instructor just needs to be a facilitator. They don't have to monitor everything that's going. Um, and it's a really cool piece that allows them to do that. So as you're seeing here, this is something they would never do. Typically, if your robot goes breaks, you call them so they can learn the principles. They can understand how it works, what corresponds to each part. And they're getting to visually see that in a, a way that they're not going to be able to see versus just staring at it. What's really cool is they see how it accesses, how it turns, and they understand it. And then they can go back and go, OK, well, I want to focus on a particular part. So then they can just look at the total display, or you can see here, they can focus in on one part. They can pick up that part. They can see how the servo interacts with it. Things that they would not, you're not gonna have them do, one, because the weight and the danger of this. Um, and then of course you get to the disassembling part where then now they get to take this apart. So you think about exposure, you think about prepping them for the industry. This is something that they can't break, but it's on par with what a real career, high demand, high way, and we're, we have the industry credential with them and the partnership to do it. Um, and again, that's just a still of what that looks like in that process. Uh, finally, I want to show you the one that's going to be coming out, uh, a few things that are coming just so as we, oh, that's got some. so that's got some bad sound, sorry about the feedback. Um, but what they're able to see here, this is for our PLC programming. So students are going to be able to completely build the entire factory all inside of a Z space. Now, this is something that most schools of all shapes and sizes, they have one static, maybe two sets of a chain conveyor, but they'll have access to a palletizer, a box selector. So whether um, you're a distribution center is Amazon or Walmart, you have it here for them. And that's what they're gonna get a chance to see here. Um, this is always a, a much deeper conversation than we had time for. So I just wanted you to know that that is also available and that's what you're seeing here as they go through it. Um, the students will have access to this PLC. They can build it from scratch or we give them their own system. Um, I'll go, uh, yeah, we're coming up on time. I know we wanted to leave enough time for questions. Is there any questions? So right now there are no more questions in the chat box, but ladies and gentlemen, please feel free to type any questions in you have. Michael and Joe are full of knowledge and they're here to answer those questions for you. Awesome. Um, hey, just so again, go ahead. I heard question. Hey, yep. so I looked at the robotic model and some of these models in there, are there any that you specifically model after like a specific brand Owen or anything so you can get certified on a specific model versus a generic model? No, well, the, the closest we have is a FANUC, but those individual programs want you to go through, um, we're not endorsed by those specific ones. I, I can tell you that's on our roadmap, that's things we're working on, but um, at, at the moment, that's where that partnership with Nocti is so good because um, depending on what your individual school does, because you know you could be doing FANUC, but your neighbor could be doing Festo and 
two miles down the road, they're doing KUKA. I just can't keep up with it. Um, and because everybody has their freedom to choose, that's been the challenge to it. But um, if there's a more specific example, I can kind of coach you through how we do handle it. Cause I, we have programs like in, uh, we're in most of the community colleges in Alabama and they, we compliment them. Their students are working on the CPT uh, for a part of the MSSC. Um, and it's, it's a great compliment, especially in the remote world. I love it. I think it's a great certification, but it's uh, just something. Uh, my, so is there any thoughts in the future using APIs or open API where you could import data? You can. That's already there. So you can bring in any of your API. Our HMI will allow you to bring in any of your code and you can you can do whatever you want. You can go both directions. Okay. That is by. Yep. Yep. Great question. That is by design. Yep. Thank you. So that powerful question. And just so you know, I want to be aware we are finishing up HVAC. This will be uh, in construction. So those will all be available August 1st. I think I'm going to show you a little bit of um, construction because this is just one that I love. We're working with the Home Builders Institute. So if you're doing HBI or you're doing NCCER, um, if you haven't really figured out by now, everything for us is about you earning that credential. And that's what allows you to do. So this is um, just a quick, this is still in development. It'll be ready August 1st, but just so you can see it, uh, this is a blueprint. Students got to know how to lead a read a blueprint um, and they can see where they're able to go through the house. Um, and it's the same process, whether it's HVAC, they're running, you know, here you can see the subfloor. So a uh, few pieces we're working on, obviously we're down in the South. We don't do subfloors, we do concrete blocks. So there's just a few pieces that we're working on the curriculum is all coming from HBI, but of course it will support, you know, industries as a whole that you're working on. Um, so you're gonna see here, six standard six foot wall that all large majority of construction programs is gonna build. They're gonna have access to that. They're gonna be able to take it apart and go from there. So you're seeing all of that right now. This will all be in Z, Z spaceified where you'll be able to see this and bring it to life and, and turn your head around, look underneath it and build it. Uh, if you wanna see the, here's the furring strips. Here's how the furring strips go on with the insulation. And um, you're able to see all that. So um, that's forthcoming very soon. And between this HVAC, um, I think somebody had mentioned about the computer science piece, just so you know, this is all publicly. So if you have a computer science program that you want to work on AR or VR, you have to make a commitment to hardware. It doesn't matter what hard, that it's a requirement. So um, we, if it's us, we'd love that. All of our APKs, Unreal Engine, all of our SDK packs are available. That's on developer.zspace.com. Again, that's open source. So do your computer science programs that really want to get into the programming of C Sharp or Unity, that is all available for you. Um, that said, I know we're coming up on time. Um, this is my cell phone, my email. If you have any more curriculum questions, I am more than happy to answer them offline. I, I thank you, Visual Sounds, for hosting us today. That was awesome. I really appreciate everybody attending. Thank you guys so much for presenting. We got a lot of great information. Uh, for all the people who are currently attending, we just want to let you know Visual Sound does offer professional development. So if you were to be purchasing ZSpaces for your school, we can come out and make sure your teachers are comfortable with how to use it. We could talk curriculum, talk pedagogy, all of that type of stuff. So please feel free to reach out with questions. If we don't have the answer, we will definitely reach out to Michael. I am not a CTE expert, but he is, and that's what we're here for. We partner together, we work together, and we're going to make sure that your schools succeed. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Do Sweet. we have any final questions for Michael and Joe while we have them here today? Thank you all very much. All right. Well, thank you all for attending. We appreciate your time. If you do have any questions that come up after this webinar is over, don't hesitate to reach out. And again, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Joe, Michael. All right. Take care. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Bye-bye.